strikes me about all these three artists is that they are still studying. So they all had varying degrees and experiences at school, but they seem to have dedicated their lives to still be studying. And one of the ways that they do that is they go out together into the field and they paint. And so I'm, I hope they're going to reveal a little bit about their process and what they're thinking to you tonight. But in order to get the conversation going, I'm going to uh, prompt them with some questions. And you can all be thinking of questions you'd like to know about. Um, so my first question, and this is for all three of you, is how did it come about that you met and that you worked together? And how much of an influence do you think you are on each other? And do you recommend working like this? What does it give you? Well, that's the question. <laughs> All right, well, let's start with that. How, how did it come about that you work together? Well, uh, it goes back to uh, a group of painters that we started out sort of loosely because of an old professor friend of mine. His name was George Sorrells from Kutztown, where I got my uh, bachelor's degree in painting. I met him at an opening at the DeMuth Foundation in Lancaster. This goes back, oh, probably into the 90s. And uh, George and I started talking about painting, and he said, you know, I, I go out every once in a while, would you like to paint outside? And I said, sure, I'd love to go out painting. And we went our separate ways, and about a year or two later, I called George up and I said, George, do you want to go painting? <laughs> we talked about this. And to make a rather long story short, over the years, I invited Bill to join us to come along painting. And then uh, later on, Eric started working. I do some art conservation work at Lancaster Galleries that shows my paintings. And Eric started working there. and. For some reason, we started talking about painting, and, and he really uh, came back with a lot of really good questions and showed me some excellent work. So I said, Eric, would you like to join us? And that's how it kind of started with the three of us. I sort of invited these guys into another loose group, and then we have continued to keep up painting together. Uh, the other group paints every so often, and people move in and out of that quite a bit. And how much of an influence do you think you are on each other? Well, I think that we are, um, to some extent, I think that we, one of the things we like to do is also go and look at art together, too. Yeah. So we have conversation about the painting. And, uh, you know, we've been to a lot of the major museums up and down the East Coast anyway, and had good, good art talk about that. So I think that's in the mix as far as influence goes. Okay. Um, and do you recommend working like this? What does it give you? I think it gives you, you know, you're working with contemporaries. So you're not only looking at great art with, in your own head. You're working with people who are doing the same thing you're doing. And it's always nice to have, you know, somebody to look at, and somebody to talk to about what's currently happening, what's currently on the picture plane in front of you while you're working. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, I think that's important. So does, to have other people in a group, hey, that's that's great. Does that happen while you're out in the field? Maybe it would be useful to describe how that setup goes. Well, if I can interject, I think the dialogue about picture plane. Uh, happens more in a in looking at painting, not necessarily specifically about our own work. It's not that often, unless one of us says, "Hey, would you like to take a look at what I'm doing?" That we actually even really look at our own work, especially on a day we're out painting. But we may, at the end of the day, uh, go somewhere to have uh, dinner or lunch. And that's where that dialogue begins. We'll talk about uh, you know, a demon coin we've seen, or a, or a Corot that we've seen, or something like that. And then that begins the dialogue about painting. Uh, I don't know. I think there are times it may be specific. 
but I think it's more specifically about painting than, than you know, JD, you know, what am I doing here? And it's also, we're also out in the weather, we're out in the landscape, so sometimes some pretty beautiful events take place, some significant things happen, and we, we all see that together, which I think is nice. It's nice to not see those things alone. Yeah. Oh, that's very true. I, th I think that shared experience is really important. There have been times I think each of us have felt when we painted alone. I know one time I went to Cranberry Island, place that I love dearly. And uh, I often will invite my friends to go along. There was one time in particular I was up there by myself and I was on the rocks on this incredible sort of bluff at this place called Lava Lane that has these great dark lava rocks. And then there's a vein of pink granite, which is incredible, that comes through this black rock. But I'm standing there in this weather. It's about to, to really do something. You know, you can see an island, Baker Island, disappearing. So you know it's coming. And I literally stopped and turned around to say something to one of these guys. Well, they're in Pennsylvania. And it is often about that shared experience, uh, that kernel of that, that is so important. Um, and I think that ties us, in a way, as painters, to a lot of the old guys. And I fondly call them the old guys, the people like Corot and, and uh, Constable that, are out, that were out there. Uh, Corot in particular because he often had other people with him, his students. Um, so he shared those experiences as well. And of course the American landscape painters, as they went west, would often go in groups. And even up to uh, Mount Desert Island in Maine, they would go in groups up there. So. We sort of joined that old, but it's very contemporary also, because it is today, so. Um, can someone comment on this Paul Greika, is it a trance that he talks about? Well, J.D. was Paul, Paul Resica, R-E-S-I-K-A. Uh, I'll let JD speak to him because JD was his student back in the 1980s. So I've met Paul uh, on several occasions and been to his studio up at Truro, Mass. But uh, go ahead. What's well, about? The, I don't know uh, how many of you were painters in the room, but there are those times, and this is the trance that Resif is talking about, and it often happens out in nature and also in the studio where you're painting and suddenly you, you have no concept of time. You, you, you may have a concept of where you are, but the paint itself becomes uh, the muse. The, the experience itself becomes the inspiration for what you're doing. Your idea that you may have started with has suddenly gone somewhere and, and it is really that process that takes over. Um, and I even hate to use the word process because that sort of brings that all down. It's, it's the experience of, of making and creating uh, in the midst of it. That, uh, and that trance part of it is, is that you're not really aware of time or anything else that's happening other than what you're focusing or what has caused you to focus me make more sense. Does that? I see so that's nodding, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Eric, I wanted to ask you about the degree of abstraction that you're working at now. And I'm kind of guessing that you haven't always worked that abstractly, but I don't know for sure. And I wonder what led to that. Um, well, it's pretty current. Uh, it's something I've been doing little by little as I've been working through things, it's just leading me more abstractly. But I think the paintings to me, they're, you know, they're landscapes. And they're, they're abstract and they're abstracted and they're, but they're still, they're very real to me. Not like this is what I see every day walking around. No, but I'm in the landscape and I'm just trying to 
pick some things out that are more meaningful and interesting to me in that moment than say uh, just copying something or I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain, but yeah. yeah, it's definitely something that I've been diving deeper into. Uh, a lot of artists that I've been looking at, uh, a lot of the abstract expressionist work, some minimalist work. So that all has a big influence, I think, what you look at every day and study and just, it's what's interesting now, so. And are, for all three of you, these paintings are made out in the field, correct? But sometimes you're working in the studio, so can you talk about the differences and the relationship that this work has to the studio work and They speak to each other, certainly. I mean, to go out into the field and make some paintings or sketches, you're bringing back some something you felt and, and some memory that will, will go into the studio work, I think. Um, but as in terms of a literal experience, to go out and paint, the tree looks like that, there's a barn and some sheep. To bring that back and make that exact painting, I don't think any three of us, any of the three of us are interested in that. But we are interested in um, maybe some of the color that took place, and maybe um, something like the uh, the temperature and, and the sounds and, and everything that was happening at that moment, and bring that back to the studio and use that as fuel for the large work. I like that idea, that fuel idea. I think it is. You know, we're, we're doing a our our painting is about a, a, a an emotional spiritual reaction to what we. Are, are seeing and feeling at the time as we're painting, even out in the landscape. And the, the studio painting, for me, is a place where I am a little bit more freed of the actual motif, what I'm standing in front of. I can use the, the language that I've been learning in the landscape then uh, to truly reflect something uh, of the nature of the experience in the studio. So the bridge is there, you know, from from plein air to to studio work. I never use them as a thing to copy. They're not you know, studies. They aren't studies. They stand on their own. They don't all make it to a wall. They're almost like a big sketchbook in my studio. There's something, and I don't think of them as sketches either. They're complete ideas, but they're they're ideas that I can can go back to and see. Uh, that may trigger something, trigger that bit of memory. But I don't recreate a painting from that. I use what I've learned to uh, be the inspiration for the next painting. Um, I have a couple of questions from Letty, who couldn't be here tonight, one of the professors. And she was interested to know what the intention was behind your titles. Or are they pretty arbitrary? Or do they, what do you feel about <coughs> titles? Well, I personally, I chose not to title my word. Um, and that's that They could be titled or they couldn't be titled. I just didn't want to impose anything on you. Say this place or that place. I just want you to look at it as what it is and how it affects you. To me, that's more gratifying, you know, than any direction that I can steer you in. So, the viewer. I find it, at times, a title can be there as the painting's finished. But the majority, <laughs> it's very difficult for me to title a painting. I have a difficult time titling a painting. I think the habit of titling a painting has started because of literally uh, when you put them on the wall, uh, the gallery or someone will ask you to title the work. And that's when I end up titling them. I do think about it. It's not random at that point, but it's really difficult for me to do that. Other than the few that really have a title. 
How about you? I, I like to connect the title, I think, to the to the uh, experience of the painting. Sometimes it's the place, and sometimes it's something else. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's my answer. Okay. I also, uh, and Lenny was interested in this. Wonder if you, in particular, uh, JD, would speak about the monotypes. I think there are students who probably don't know what that process is. Mm -hmm. Well, the monotypes that I that I do are literally at this point there are only two sizes of monotype, and they I use a, a small plate of glass for both of them. I I draw on the glass uh, with printer's ink. Basically, it's a simple speedball ink, and those are great printmaking papers. I choose not to dampen my paper which is a typical process for monotype or any kind of printing. I use dry paper, I'll press it onto the plate, and then I use a bone fold, which is basically a small piece of bone. I don't know if you're familiar with that. They were used in the old days to fold a piece of paper. I'll use that to uh, rub the back of the paper to transfer the print. So That's you, the technical. You could do those in the field. I could do those in the field. That's right. It's a simple process. Simple process. That technically is. Yeah. It's a surprise when you start doing it. Because, of course, like anything else that you print, it's in reverse. So sometimes you think, oh, it's beautiful. You print it and you think, oh, why didn't I think of putting that on the other side? <laughs> but it's a, it's a marvelous. And I, I know that all three of us are in love with paper. You know, there's something about the different types of paper that you and that can be an exciting part of printmaking as well as drawing. So, who else has a question? Uh, how much do you think uh, your age affects your paintings? Maybe we should ask Eric. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it affects like anything going through life and you're interested one day in something and sometimes you're not. Uh, I don't really think age, it's, it's tough, it's a general question I guess. It affects me and my work I think because of, that's a really hard question, thanks for asking. <laughs> I think one of the things Eric touched on is, is something that I believe deeply about painting. Is that it is about the truth about who you are and what you're experiencing. It is about my life. You know, to be honest with you, the paintings are about what I am experiencing in my life. Good, bad, indifferent. It is hopefully being reflected in the painting. It's not a simple thing. It is, it is a deeply welled uh, part of who I am. Yeah, about two years ago I had some major surgeries. As a part of getting older, you get used to that. But JD had me out painting 11 days after my third surgery in 30-something degrees. <laughs> I was good mad about it, too. Oh, the painting was awful. Yeah. I had to bring a little stool in the whole nine yards, but we did it. Because you do paint through life. You can't, you know, I know why he was doing that. Because I wasn't going to, you know, lay on the couch and, and watch reruns of whatever. Um, it was time to get out and start moving again. And I was really glad he did it later. <laughs> in fact, the, the only snow scene that's here in my work it's called Recovering Cold. Yeah, that was the painting. And that was you had a great one of the paintings the day that Bill and I were out. My yeah. painting isn't here. Have you all always been landscape painters or plein air painters? We've painted other other media, uh, other uh, other mediums too. For, you know, still I taught a still life class for four years. I really loved that. Um, but yeah, we do figure and other things too. How did you come to I think this is the first love. I can't speak for these guys, but yeah. Um, I started out doing more figurative work, a lot of portraits, and uh, I still love it. You know, I, I still paint them. Uh, but 
but I don't know, landscape just getting involved with these guys and really working out there, working through something like that. You know, I sort of hooked onto it a little more. It, it's a vehicle that I use for the abstraction now, you know, the landscape, the color, the sound, all those sensory things. I think you can get it by looking at a still life or anything really, but for me it's a it's a helpful part. How does um does painting atmosphere itself affect the sound that you have Well I think there's atmosphere in in everything. There's atmosphere between us. Right. You know, that negative space is something. Mm -hmm. but to try to convey that uh, on a flat picture plane is all about all of those other things, that experience, and really being in tune with truly observing. Mm -hmm. You know, observation is paramount. Even in the invented things, it's because it's collective. That's what the sketchbooks, that's what all the painting's about, is collecting a knowledge, is understanding that. If you're passionate about it, if that's what you're interested in, yeah. you know. Um, I think the sky and the atmosphere are as uh, easy or as difficult as painting a pear. Sure. It's the same thing. I'm pa more passionate about this. But it's, it is as studied and as wonderful and marvelous as that, or the figure, you know. It's sort of like what's saying between you and that subject and considering all that stuff. Right, right. How do you create that atmosphere? How do you, how do you convey that uh, space? You know, we were at the Baltimore Museum today, and I was looking at uh, that great Chardin, that woman throwing the ball up, and I thought, how in the world did he, he create that sense of space between that hand, the ball, and that woman's face? It was amazing. That's an amazing bit of painting, you know? Man, I wish I could paint that. You know? You can learn a lot from Chardin. <laughs> No, I just wanted to say at your Friday Friends opening, you had a talk, this was years ago, and someone asked George Sorrells. They said, well, how do you paint clouds? They're always moving. He said, you don't paint the clouds, you paint what you know about the clouds. Yeah. I thought, what a great answer. Right. Yeah, right. And that goes perfectly with what you were saying, all that knowledge that comes into you from being out there observing for so many years. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm curious about uh, some more about the process. You touched on a little bit when you talked about painting in the snow. So you folks understand these guys go out in bad weather, they go out when it's cold, they go out when it gets sunny and they have to dress for the weather and they have to take along equipment and they have to have easels that work in the, in the wind. So but they you, only go to bug-free zones. <laughs> and then they have to transport wet oil paint back so it doesn't get all smeared. So that, that kind of thing, I'm interested in that. I just got back Saturday from Tennessee. I was painting in the Great Smoky Mountains. I taught a class at the Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. And it was windy, and it was foggy, and it was rainy, and there were bugs, and there were creatures, and uh, tourists. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a lot to it, contend with out in the open. There is. And you talk about getting into the trance. You've got to get yourself glued onto that rectangle to make that work. And uh, I don't know how to, to talk about that in a way other than to say you've really got to up your focus and not worry about the person behind you talking to you. And if you can drive <laughs> as close as you can possibly get to where you're going to set up, that always that helps. helps. <laughs> well, then there were people like George O'Keefe that built a vehicle. Yes. Came yeah. I guess a lot of people have done that. Yeah. It is, though, it's, it's a, you become a creature of, of uh, you, f you learn really quickly what to leave behind after you've been lugging it for a while. You know, you don't need to lug everything with you. 
you start being very conservative. Uh, it is one of the reasons why the plein air work for most of us is relatively small. Once in a while they get larger out there, but it's easier to move around with this size if you're going to be, you know, hiking for a little bit or climbing over rocks or something. But uh, I think that happens through time, a little bit of that kind of, you know, knowing which easel is going to work best for you, that sort of thing. So older is better, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, no, yes. that addresses <laughs> that. Yeah, that's a good question. Any what other? do you when you do your sketchbooks? Do you use gouache or ink? What do you use? I've been using gouache this year, and I really love it. Just black and white. Yeah, I, I use charcoal and water. Spit or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you have handy. Whatever you have on hand. Yeah. I've been using ink, but I'll, I'll use gouache also at times and charcoal at times. In fact, you often, you know, there are times you use what you find when you're out there. So. Yeah, I was curious about that too because you have the monotypes and the books are all neutral, and but part of what you're experiencing is the color and other kinds of things going on. So I'm curious why you also do the black and white studies as well as the color in the moment. How does that look? That's a good question. That's a good question. For me, it's, it's an interesting. I do often take like a sepia and a black. So I can get a cool, you know, use the black with a lot of water, that becomes a cool gray. You add your sepia, that warms things up so you can get spatial relationships of color with a relatively small palette that way. Um, the mono prints, I've just been making them black and white. Yeah. It's just not always about color. And, and we all know painters who work in, in a black and white medium, and it's, it is about color. They're, yes. they're making colorful paintings, yes. really. Yeah. Um, I guess that's... Do you do your, um, your sketches as value studies first before you begin a painting? No. no. I don't. No. From time to time, I mean, you know, I'll throw a little charcoal on there and just to get things going, you know, things moving and ideas started. And then it just, once you start to add the color, anyway, all that goes out the window. So. <laughs> but it's just, you know, to get yourself moving a little. The, the other part of your question is interesting because I don't know, and Eric and Bill can answer that also, I don't use the sketchbook as a direct, I don't make paintings from the sketchbook. It's almost like I don't make paintings from the plein air paintings. Uh, I just choose not to. It's all, it's still part of me. Uh, Remembering. They are their own thing. Some of the sketches are done, you know, a week after I've been to the place. Some of them are done out in the open air. But they are a way of keeping my hand working and thinking visually. Yeah. I mean, for me, they're sort of just thoughts in my head and what you see and what even. When you're out there, it's just an immediate sense of getting things done. And it gives me different ideas. Yeah, I will page through a sketchbook from three years ago and just look through it and be like, it, it feeds you a little bit. When you paint on paper, are they prepared paper? Do you do something to them ahead of time? Yeah, yeah. I always, uh, I always use a rabbit skin glue as a uh, sort of a priming medium. This way, it sort of preserves the paper, and you're not adding like a gesso that totally eliminates the surface. So that's what I'll typically do, or uh, amber shellac or something. Today, uh, I don't do it often, but you can use a, 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 a like a 
acrylic matte medium is actually made of almost the same thing they're using now to, as a binder in paper. So you can use that as a ground, which will allow you to see the color of the paper. I don't often use that, but it's something that you can do today. I'll do the more traditional things as well, often. I'll use a rabbit skin glue, and if I put a gesso on, I usually do, you know, coat both sides of the paper, make sure it's completely covered, that kind of thing. Do you do that when you paint on panels too? Yes. The panels, I always, if I use a masonite or a millboard, that type of thing, I'll cut the rabbit skin glue or the uh, uh, shellac so it penetrates the surface and doesn't lay on the top. I don't want the surface to get too slick. I want it to stop the oil from completely soaking out of the, the paint. What do you cut the shellac with? Uh, denatured alcohol. I'll usually go almost half. So I think we could continue the questions informally. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.